What makes organized crime so difficult to abate is its ability to span nations and infiltrate multiple sectors of society. In South Africa, the recent assassination of a top police officer points to the dangerously close links between police and organized criminal networks. In Somaliland, the demand for exotic pets in the Gulf states is having a detrimental effect on cheetah populations. You're listening to Africa and the Global Illicit Economy from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. This week, we're in East and Southern Africa. I'm your host, Lindim Tongana. Welcome back. This just in, a high-profile investigator of the Cape Town Police's anti-gang unit has been shot and killed this afternoon. Carl Kinnear was gunned down in front of his Bishop Levis home. Authorities are combing the scene for evidence. Monique Mortlock is there. She joins Staying us now. with that story, the murder of the top anti-gang unit investigator has opened up a can of worms and war has been declared on those responsible. Family, friends and colleagues today pay tribute to the slain officer. At 3 p.m. on Friday, 18 September 2020, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear, a top detective with the Western Cape Anti-Gang Unit, pulled up outside his home on Gearing Street in the Bishop Levis suburb of Cape Town. Still seated in his car, Kinnear was met with the barrel of a gun as the lone gunman fired four shots into the driver's window. The celebrated senior police investigator died on the spot, his head slumped over the steering wheel. A crowd of neighbors arrived at the scene, followed by police officers and then journalists. Between the mourning and the lamenting, all agreed that this was a cold-blooded assassination. Kinnear's death has been linked to a number of investigations that he's involved in. There's quite a lot of smoke and mirrors. There are a lot of stories doing the rounds, but mostly the theories at the moment center on his involvement in investigating a guns to gangs scandal, which involved the central firearms registry under the police and may also have implicated some senior police officers. He was also involved in investigating, according to some media reports, an international syndicate involved in smuggling gold and diamonds. So there are a number of those particular cases which tie together, but I think that there's certainly a growing body of evidence that his death was sanctioned at a high level by gang bosses, that it may have involved senior police officers. And, you know, in some ways that that, through carrying out his investigations, Kinnear crossed a line both within the police and within the gangs. Julian Rademeyer is the director of the Organized Crime Observatory for East and Southern Africa at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I think what makes the latest cases quite unique is the seniority of the police officers involved and the fact that they were specifically involved in investigating organized crime. So two cases six months apart, Lieutenant Charles Kinnear from the Western Cape Anti-Gang Unit section commander there who was assassinated outside his home last month. And then almost to the day, six months before that, we had Lieutenant Colonel Leroy Brevere, who was an organized crime investigator who'd been looking at rhino poaching syndicates, uh, was targeted on his way to work by either one gunman or a number of gunmen armed with high-powered weapons. I think this in some ways marks quite a dramatic shift, and I think it's a seismic shift in South Africa. We have had many cases where police officers have been murdered, some in the line of duty, some outside of that. Last year, for example, there were around 40. What do these killings say about the relationship between organized criminal networks and the South African police service? You know, South Africa has never really had an effective anti-corruption strategy or an effective body to investigate corruption within its police service. Not in the apartheid years, not since the dawn of democracy. And one of the difficulties that we have is that in order to investigate organized crime, police have to expose themselves directly into it. They have to venture into the underworld. They have to set up alliances with an array of people that are involved in that underworld to get information, to build the information networks that are necessary to build cases. And it's an inherently compromising and corrupting environment. And I think in some ways, the fact that someone out there, some gangsters, possibly some police felt so comfortable that they could assassinate a lieutenant colonel like Kinnear, or that potentially a group of rhino poachers felt that they could assassinate a leading investigator into rhino poaching syndicates shows the impact that that corruption has had, both in terms of levels of respect that society have for the police and the concern that, that gang bosses and criminals have for any potential repercussion. 
Why is it that corruption has become so intertwined within the South African police force? So there's always been a quite an uncomfortable relationship between police and gangs and organized crime and the role of pursuer and pursue. For many years, there's been an unwritten rule that the police do their jobs, organized crime figures try and ensure that they are not caught up in investigations. But this marks a new step where lines have been crossed, where police that are seen to be threatening in some way are targeted and taken out. I think it's in many ways, it's a decisive moment for South Africa. I think it's a case where we are reaping the whirlwind from years where organized crime has been allowed to gain a stranglehold on South African society, where corruption has become more endemic within the police service, where it's reached the point where individual police officers simply can't trust the people that they work with. When you talk about the extent of the power and influence of organized criminal networks in South Africa and how they've infiltrated the police, is this a case of a few bad apples? No, it's certainly not a case of a few bad apples. We've seen over the years a steady erosion of law enforcement structures, um, the criminal justice system in South Africa. We've seen what has happened, for instance, to the Police Crime Intelligence Unit, which is meant to lead the way in gathering intelligence and information on organized crime activity and keeping government informed about the threats that are posed by that. And how that unit became utterly corrupted, how secret funds that were intended for organized crime investigations were looted, how particularly during the years of President Jacob Zuma's presidency, it became a tool in political battles. The 2010 conviction of South Africa's late former commissioner to the police service, Jackie Selebi, exemplifies the systemic corruption. After an eight-month court case, the former president of Interpol, with ties to notorious drug lords, was convicted of corruption, fraud and racketeering. Advocate Willy Hofmeier admitted that Sir Levy's trial and conviction was hampered by politics in a 2019 inquiry. So there was a significant amount of political interference. Um, we were particularly uh, obstructed by people in crime intelligence, but also some of the other intelligence agencies. And I think the sort of broader concern that we developed at the time is that people in the NPA were collaborating with those outside the NPA to try and ensure that the prosecution didn't happen. Julian, what has been the response to these police assassinations? Do you think this might be a key moment that will invigorate the police service and the Independent Police Investigative Directorate to really root out corruption from within its ranks? It seems clear that there is quite an overwhelming response to these murders. But I think that we need something more. I think that we do need a much greater societal response to this. Because the danger is that we end up going down a very slippery slope. I think that we've also reached a point in South African society where we are so punch drunk, so near to a daily litany of violence that these kinds of things hardly cause the shock waves that they should. We live in a country where there's been a steady growth in assassinations over the years, particularly between 2013 and, and peaking in around 2017 and 2018. Many of those linked to the taxi industry, uh, large numbers of political hits, particularly in places like KwaZulu-Natal province, where we at the, the Global Initiative have recorded around 345 political assassinations since 2010 the vast majority of them involving politicians or people linked to the ruling African National Congress and tied to internecine battles within the party. We've also seen, and this is quite worrying, where taxi hits have declined, we've seen growing cases of organized crime hits. And we've seen personal hits too, most recently in Johannesburg, where a doctor was assassinated in the street. So there's a worrying normalization of assassination in South Africa. Unless we start seeing investigations into that, unless we start seeing targeted investigations going after the criminal networks, not only the hitmen, we are again in a very dangerous place. There's one study that's been done which shows that fewer than 10% of cases where people have been assassinated result in successful prosecutions and convictions. Have there been any updates on the investigations so far? In the case of Kinnear, one suspect has been arrested, a debt collector and former bouncer from the Johannesburg area. He was working as a private detective, and it seems that he was asked to track Kinnear's cell phone, which allowed the hitman to find him and carry out the hit. 
There have been no other arrests at this stage. Police investigations are continuing. We are hopeful that there will be further arrests which would actually unravel this and lead to the people who plotted and planned the killing. In the case of Leroy Brevet, one person has been arrested in the Eastern Cape province, allegedly one of the gunmen or the gunmen, and it's someone who handed himself over to police during their investigations. Lastly, Julian, what would you say are the major takeaways from the recent assassinations? What we don't have and what doesn't happen that often is cases where people who are investigating organized crime, investigating gangs, are specifically targeted to be taken out because they're seen as an obstacle. And I think, you know, in some ways in the Kinnear case, this may actually have been an overreach on the part of the gang bosses and potentially corrupt police who were involved in his murder. And, you know, hopefully the one thing that we could take away from it is that these killings become something of a tipping point that galvanize a social response that push government to start taking actions, targeting investigations of organized crime in South Africa. That was Julian Rademeyer, the director of the Organized Crime Observatory for East and Southern Africa at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Cheetahs are the world's fastest land animal capable of running up to 128 kilometers per hour. In Somaliland, they're in a race for their own survival. A total of 25 cheetah cubs destined for the homes of exotic pet owners have been reported as stolen or rescued in Somaliland this year. Cheetah cubs are sold at anywhere from $200 to $300 in Somaliland. In Gulf states, smugglers stand to make 50 times as much for a healthy cub. The exact number of cheetah cubs that are trafficked is hard to pin down, but what is known is that Ethiopia's cheetah population currently totals no more than 300 adults and adolescent species. In response to dwindling cheetah populations, Somaliland has been ramping up convictions and interventions in cheetah smuggling. But while smuggling cheetah cubs from point A to point B is becoming more difficult, purchasing one on the market is not. It's not so much underground, actually, it's quite in the open. It's easy to find cheetahs offered for sale online on social media or e-commerce platforms. And also people posing with their pet cheetahs on the internet. Independent illegal wildlife trade expert Patricia Tricorake uncovers the ins and outs of the illegal cheetah trade and the long-standing international effort to hold everyone on the value chain accountable. Patricia, why is it that Somaliland has become the main conduit for this industry to trade? I wouldn't call Somaliland the main conduit. I have to say that that is where the most action has been taken to uh, combat the trade. And this is why the numbers appear really high there. That's where we have more information. However, Somaliland's geographical location is key for traffickers because it's located right across the Gulf of Aden. So it is an easy way out of Africa. How then are cheetahs moved from the Horn of Africa to Gulf countries? The main way that we have received reports of is by boat. They use dows, boats that are used to transport livestock, or they hide the animals in canisters. Or even, as there was a report that found that during an investigation in Yemen, the people that were transporting goods, they would also transport items like weapons. The other way that they have a transporting them is that there are people in the Arabian Peninsula who own land in Africa, and they own private jets too. So we have had a few reports of jets that are traveling back and forth between the two regions, and we have never been able to achieve an inspection. If the cubs make it to the Gulf alive, they're purchased by wealthy, exotic pet enthusiasts, many of whom are not equipped with the skills or knowledge to care for the young cubs. There might be some owners that do, but the majority don't appear to know how to care. I actually met an exotic animal owner who gave his animals salt water to drink. I had to explain to him that that's not a good idea. So unfortunately, what this results in is that many of those pet cheetahs don't make it over, let's say, a year. 
it's a really bad thing. And we tried with the Cheetah Conservation Fund when I was working there. We traveled the Emirates to try to train owners on the care of cheetahs, but unfortunately, they didn't show up because they do something illegal. What is the legislation in some of these Gulf states? Is it in fact illegal to own a pet cheetah? They're all parties to the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species. So what that means is that they don't allow the trade of the species that are listed under CITES and cheetahs are Appendix 1, which is you cannot trade cheetahs commercially. Additionally, they have begun to implement some laws that ban the ownership of these pets. The United Arab Emirates, they enacted a law in December of 2016 banning the private ownership of exotic and dangerous pets. However, we haven't seen many reports of conflict in those countries, even after those laws have been enacted. So the Emirates have had no confiscations since 2015, except for four cheetahs that were confiscated this year near the border in Abu Dhabi. Considering that these populations are disappearing very fast, what is the response in regions like Somaliland in terms of legislation and law enforcement? In 2018, Somaliland ratified a forestry and wildlife law. Right after that, there was the first conviction for cheetah smuggling. Somaliland is a country that has done more confiscations, nearly 200 since I started working there. Unfortunately, it's a country where poverty is rampant. They're not a recognized country. So internationally, they're not officially a country. They are an autonomous region or self-declared region. So um, they're doing whatever they can, and they're doing a really good job. Ethiopia is the same case, except they have to deal with the eastern part of Ethiopia, which is the Ethiopia-Somali region, which is very isolated, and it has its own regional government. So all the countries are really trying hard, but definitely the resources are not enough. And Patricia, do you think that any conflict exists between the international community and African states as to the need to prioritize cheetah smuggling as a major issue? I don't think there's a conflict. In 2013, Ethiopia, Kenya and Uganda proposed to include the issue of illegal cheetah trade on the agenda. A commission, an independent study that concluded trade is of concern. After that, CITES was very supportive and the parties. They adopted many recommendations and decisions that had mainly to do with enforcement, collaboration, demand reduction, places where to place the confiscated animals, etc. Unfortunately, in 2018, at a conference in Sochi, in Russia, CITES concluded that the trade was limited based on a questionnaire that was sent to all 183 parties. Only a few of those replied. And of all the replies, they concluded that only been 32 confiscated cheetah products in the last three years, which doesn't sound a lot like a lot. But unfortunately, that is based on official confiscation numbers provided by government. So all the cheetahs that are not confiscated are not included in there. Besides the cheetahs in Somaliland, it's not a recognized nation. So CITES has to base their conclusions on official numbers. So again, Ethiopia and Kenya submitted information indicating that the trade continues, that it's of great concern. But since it was no official data, the Middle Eastern countries decided that that was not data that could be valid. So finally, in last year's conference of the parties, they decided that the issue of illegal cheetah trade is going to be handled by a joint task force with CITES and the Convention for Migratory Species, the Big Cat Task Force. And my concern is only that because it's big cats in general, I fear that the issue of cheetahs might get diluted with the other big cat issues. That, that is one concern. The task force is in the process of being formed. We don't know what it's going to look like, but we're working with other NGOs to push for cheetah experts and cheetah NGOs that are dedicated to researching the cheetah trade. That was Patricia Trikorake, an independent illegal wildlife trade expert. (laughs) 
Organized crime can come with great financial gains, but changes the lives of many. In South Africa, Western Cape Anti-Gang Unit Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear was assassinated for his efforts to root out those in the big business of organized crime. But these criminal actors might have overreached this time. The social pressure that has emerged from the outrage over the Lieutenant Colonel's death could lead to a major turning point on the road to ending police corruption and fear of speaking up once and for all. Tackling cheetah smuggling between Somaliland and wealthy Gulf states has been an ongoing battle, riddled with misreporting and a lack of buy-in by stakeholders along the value chain. But as international governments are starting to recognize the need for cohesive efforts to save cheetah populations, the future for the fast-moving cat is possibly becoming brighter. That's it for this week's Conversations, but here are a few more developments in the global illicit economy of East and Southern Africa. Coffee farmers affiliated to Getiwa Coffee Factory in the county of Moranga are counting losses following a robbery at the factory on Thursday night. The factory in Kiharu constituency lost 51 bags of coffee valued at 8.9 million shillings. One of the storage facilities used by the Kiamariga factory in Nyeri County in total disbelief. The theft reported Farmers of Kenya's world-famous coffee, known as Black Gold, are experiencing a resurgence in large-scale coffee heists. The coffee variety is sold at premium prices at the New York Coffee Exchange. Its worldwide recognition and high value makes it a particularly attractive target for thefts. Coffee thefts in Kenya reached their peak in 2011. That year, 10 people were killed in coffee heists, with countless others drowning or injuring themselves. Most of the thefts occur at factories of rural cooperatives, where coffee beans are stored and processed before sale. Farmers robbed of their beans are not reimbursed for stolen coffee, even though many rely entirely on coffee for their income. Cooperatives meant to improve the lives of farmers claim that coffee beans cannot be insured because it is not economically viable. In response to increased thefts, coffee farmers are ramping up security at their farms. In interviews with the Global Initiative, Mary Wangari, a farmer, revealed that she'd hired a vigilante group of 15 young men to guard her 10-acre farm during harvesting season. Factories have also been forced to hire their own security. But due to low profits and high factory expenses, cooperatives cannot afford well-armed ones. Gangs have adapted and travel in groups of 20 or more, wielding guns, machetes and beating security guards. Part of the difficulty in dealing with these coffee cartels is that these gangs may be protected by powerful connections in business and politics. In a private report by the Ministry of Internal Security and Provincial Administration in 2011, two politicians were linked to coffee theft. Farmers also believe that coffee gangs are protected by police. Coffee theft shows very few signs of letting up. As long as the value of Kenya's black gold remains high on the market, coffee cartels will continue with their heists, putting a strain on farmers who depend on coffee to make a living. South Africa is also facing theft of its very own gold, the mineral that is. Illegal gold mining is on the rise in South Africa. Large mining operations have been left abandoned in the wake of a sharp decline in the country's mining sector. These abandoned shafts have become targets for illegal miners known as Zamazamas, who spend months underground searching for gold. Halts in operation due to labor disputes provide added opportunity for illegal miners the Global Initiative's Julian Rademeyer reveals just how deep this corruption goes. I was recently talking to someone for a piece that we were looking at in relation to illegal mining in South Africa. And certainly in the mining industry, there are cases where they are unable to report information about criminal networks and syndicates to local police stations because those police stations are so corrupted that they are seen to be totally in the pocket of the network smuggling gold and diamonds. I've heard stories, for instance, of police officers having to take case dockets home with them at night to ensure that evidence doesn't go missing. Police officers who simply can't trust the person sitting at the desk across from them. We'll cover more on illegal gold mining in the next edition for East and Southern Africa. Thanks for tuning in for this week's episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy. A special thanks to our guests this week, Julian Rademeyer and Patricia Trikorake. 
If you want to learn more about the topics discussed in this episode, take a look at the East and Southern Africa Risk Bulletin No. 12 on the GI's website, www.globalinitiative.net. If you like what you read, stay around and read some more of the GI's other publications for expert analysis on topics that are defining the future of our world. You can also listen to last week's episode. Please take the time to leave a review, subscribe and share the podcast on social media. It helps us get noticed and improve the show. When you hear from us again, we'll be focusing on the illicit economy in North Africa and the Sahel. Until then, this podcast was produced by Alexandria Sahai-Williams. I'm Lindim Tongana. Thanks for listening.